Hello, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, in his, uh, his and in between us. My name's Dan. Welcome back to another Pat Reports. It's Friday, May 29th, 2020. Now, this is something that I would normally mention at the end of my videos, but due to the content I am forced to put out, I've decided that occasionally I'm going to add this to the start. As you know, the content of my videos can be alarming. It can often, in fact, in most cases, go against YouTube's friendly advertising guidelines meaning that the majority of my videos are demonetized or have extremely restricted monetization. For that reason, I am incredibly grateful for the generosity of all of those who currently support the channel with either one-off donations, buying channel merch or via the Patreon app. The channel truly does rely on that generosity and the support really does help me to continue doing this daily and is something I want to be able to continue doing full time once this whole lockdown thing is over. Before I started this channel, I was working on a business which had some startup issues, and while I was waiting for them to be resolved, I really got stuck into the channel. And I'd love to be able to make this a full-time and permanent fixture into the future, as in all honesty, I am far more passionate about doing this. Therefore, although there is absolutely no obligation to do so, as all my content will always remain free, I would be incredibly grateful to anyone who feels that they could help in any of the aforementioned ways. It will ensure that I can continue to provide this service and continue to improve the quality of the production and hopefully enable me to bring people on board in order to help with the running of the channel. Thank you. Today we're starting with an update to a situation which was particularly disturbing to myself and others in the YouTube community. Something that I reported on on the 11th of February, the 13th of February and the 13th of March when I was made aware of the information and when the person involved was in court. Michael Wheeler, aka Spitshine69, was outed earlier this year to the YouTube community as a dirty pedo, after information that was available online but was only reported on in obscure local rag, the Cumberland and Westmoreland Herald, which is one of the reasons I do these PAP reports, so I can find and bring together all in one place the news that's important. 40-year-old Wheeler from Appleby was under investigation and had been going to court for over a year regarding 10 child sex offences, including two counts of raping a girl under 13, three charges of sexual assault, one count of attempted sexual assault, all of which are alleged to have taken place between September 2011 and December 2016. In addition, he faced two charges of possessing indecent images of a child in Kent between October 2016 and May 2017, as well as two counts of making indecent images of a child also in Kent between November 2004 and May 2017. I was following the story and my last report on this was on the 13th of March after his trial which found count 1, 2 and 3 sexual assaults on a female under 13 with penetration, all found guilty unanimously, count 4 attempting to sexually assault a female under 13, not guilty, count 5 of rape of a girl under 13, the jury were unable to agree on a verdict, count 6 the rape of a girl under 13, the guilty, guilty by majority verdict, Count seven and eight possessing indecent photographs of a child, both charges found guilty unanimously. And count nine and ten making indecent Im images of a child, both charges again unanimously guilty. Although the jury were unable to come to a conclusion on count five, the prosecution did ask for the charge to remain on file given the verdicts of the other counts. These offences were said to be so harrowing that the jury members have been given five years off of any further jury service. Wheeler's sentencing was due to have been on the 28th of February, but the judge was unable to sit on that day, so it was postponed, whilst Wheeler was remanded in custody. His sentencing was held on the 27th, just two days ago, and the news is now that Spitshine69 is going to be spitshining for 16 years. Not suspended. It's a shame the judge didn't keep him a Spitshine69, because 69 years would be more suitable for a pedo scum like him. Not really sure what's happening to our local governments recently. Just the other day, I spoke of a DJ and karaoke singer who received a noise complaint letter from his local council after playing music and singing for his neighbors from his front garden in an attempt to lift spirits. Well, today we have news of 76 year old DJ who has been ordered to stop playing Vera Lynn during clap for carers based on the complaint of just one person. 76 year old Tommy Coombs from Bletchingdon in Oxfordshire has been said to have played Vera Lynn from his garden every Thursday during the mind numbing and socially compliant exercise clap for carers, but has now been threatened with a fine after a complaint from just one person. Tommy said, I couldn't believe it. There are 
1,200 people in the village and 1,100 of them support me. The letter from Cherwell District Council said, I write to advise you that a complaint has been received about noise nuisance from your address due to music being played at excessive levels on Thursday evenings. The council officer said that no investigation had actually been carried out, but said that if the council received any more complaints, it would investigate. Maybe it's time people started complaining about the f***ing racket that the clappers are making, banging on pots and pans, letting off fireworks, frightening dogs, and interrupting my peace and quiet. Especially if it only takes one complaint in order for the council to take some action. Isn't it a shame they don't take such quick action with incidents that really do matter? Tommy said at eight o'clock I'll get everyone's attention and say three minutes of clapping, then we'll have three cheers for the NHS, then I'll play a few tunes until nine o'clock. The whole village joins in with it. People are dancing in the streets. Anne-Marie Plass, the woman who supposedly started the whole NHS clap, said this week's event should be the last because she feared it was becoming politicised. You think it's a bit late for that? I mean, it was a nice gesture when it started and should have been a one-off, maybe a yearly thing to show some appreciation, but this whole weekly thing has gotten way out of control. The Dominic Cummings investigation into whether he did breach any lockdown rules has come to a conclusion. Durham police have said that he may have breached lockdown rules, but won't be taking any further action. As you all know already, Cummings drove from London to Durham a journey of 260 miles to self-isolate at his parents' farm, but whilst there he took a drive from the farm to Barnard Castle to check if his eyesight was okay and he was fit to drive. Durham police have said that he might have committed a minor breach of the guidelines when he drove to the castle. Now I don't care what your thoughts are on the political nature of the debate in the, in the mainstream media, but I still think he had other options rather than drive the 260 miles himself. As some people have said, he was taking his son there to keep him safe as Dominic had presented with symptoms, but yet he's supposed to have been staying there himself, which kind of negates any argument in my eyes. Although the guidelines are not law, he should have still made an effort to set an example. However, attempting to drive in order to check one's eyesight is completely moronic and is more on par with driving without due care and attention or dangerous driving, which seems to have been completely overlooked, somewhat in favour of concentrating on the lockdown rules breach. Now, I know many of you disagree with me on this, which is, of course, completely fine. But can any of you really, hand on heart, say that driving to see if you're fit to drive is not a very dangerous thing to do? George Floyd, as many of you will already know, is a black man who was killed in Minneapolis just a few days ago after being pinned down by police until he lost consciousness and then went on to die. Well, the good old folks of Minneapolis decided they certainly were not going to take it lying down and within hours of the incident, crowds gathered to protest the unlawful killing. Tensions have not eased as more protests have been taking place, being live streamed across the internet, which is a great idea. Not just the live streaming, but the people actually coming together and fighting for some justice. However, I have noticed that some people who are at the rock, uh, protests seem to not be there for the right reasons. Two days ago, I was watching the stream and, and saw dozens of people breaking into a Target store and looting it. People running in empty handed and leaving moments later with an armful of goods, which made me think about the police. Protests are a democratic right. We have the right to protest here too, but many people either do not understand the laws around protesting or use protests as a means to commit another crime. And unfortunately, that's exactly what the police are hoping for. The live streams that I watched saw police fire rubber bullets and tear gas into crowds of people, injuring some, which of course, if the protesters were all doing what they were there to do, raise awareness and publicity, and the police would have been completely screwed, but because people did start looting and damaging property, it then gave the police the power to use force. In fact, last night, things got so out of control that a Minneapolis police station was set on fire, not only breaking the law, but incredibly dangerous and a threat to people's lives. However, there seems to be indications that the fire was set by the police themselves in order to create an action that would require a forceful response. Johnny 5 uploaded a video in which he calls out a man as an agent provocateur.
You can hear the helicopter in the background and he is carrying an umbrella which could very well be an identifying marker. And it also appears that the man has allegedly been identified by his ex-wife, calling him out saying that, he's, saying that the mask and gloves were hers. Footage showed several buildings on fire in the neighbourhood located to the southeast of the city centre. Meanwhile, the Minnesota National Guard, which had been deployed earlier in the day by Governor Tim Waltz, said it was dispatching 500 soldiers to Minneapolis and St Paul. St Paul is the twin of Minneapolis, the twin town. Our mission is to protect life, he says, preserve property and the right to peacefully demonstrate. A key objective is to ensure fire departments are able to respond to calls. Earlier on Thursday, the US Attorney's Office and the FBI in Minneapolis said that they were conducting a robust criminal investigation into the death. Donald Trump has said he had asked an investigation to be expedited. The FBI is also investigating whether Mr Floyd's civil rights were violated. Mr Chauvin, the officer who trod on Mr Floyd's neck, was fired on Tuesday with three other police involved in the arrest. The next day, the mayor called for him to be criminally charged. He also appealed for the activation of the National Guard. Now, the problem is, although I know that people are upset, there is fault on both sides here. The police themselves tried to corral the protesters and block them into a small area before tensions grew and they used force. Had the police simply lined the streets to stop property being damaged, and let the protesters march, then this would likely have helped in curtailing any violence, but they didn't, and they reacted badly to the protesters, which then caused the protesters to become more angry and tempers flared. I fully agree with their right to protest, and they should. The killing of George Floyd was horrific and upsetting to watch, and I fully understand that people are angry and upset over it, but breaking laws in order to get your point across about someone else breaking the law isn't the way to go. And we see this in so many similar situations, generally where the police are tasked with pushing people over the edge in order to get that reaction, meaning that they can then steam in, in which happens here in the UK too. I want people to be able to have their voices heard. I want people to be able to carry out their lawful protest, as is their right. But I don't want the police to have a reason to then start attacking and potentially killing more people, because that's exactly what they're waiting for. Otherwise, they would have let the crowd carry out their protest while the police did their job and simply protect property and people. But no, they had to go in all heavy handed and roll the protesters into an angry frenzy, which is now seeing property damaged and potentially people injured or worse. If you attend a protest, remember that there are always people who will attempt to cause trouble. Trouble, Even if you see someone else who is breaking the law at the protest, uh, a protest, don't join in. Distance yourself from them. Remind people that even though you might be protesting about an injustice, Creating an injustice to others defeats the whole point of your protest and makes your argument moot. It's well known that police will infiltrate, infiltrate groups to stir up trouble and give the police a reason to come down hard. Use your heads and don't join in if you see someone doing something wrong. Don't lower yourself to the same standards of those you despise. It will never end well. There is in fact a petition on change.org for justice for George which is looking for 6 million signatures. At the time of recording this, it was just shy of 4.8 million. The link, is in the, the, the link to the petition is in the description. Please consider going over and adding your name, as this really has to stop and justice really does need to be served on the cops and the force for this terrible and unwarranted situation. Even though it's not in the UK, we are all human beings and we all deserve the right to life. What do you think? Do you think I'm wrong? <laughs> I'd be interested to hear. Let me know what you think in the comments. 34 year old former police constable Stuart Bradshaw from Overly Crescent in Howarden, or Howarden has been jailed for eight months at Mould Crown Court for sexual offences against girls under the age of 16 between 2011 and 2014, including instigating two girls to engage in sexual activity over a period of three years. Ellen Owen, prosecuting, told Mould Crown Court how Bradshaw would pose online as an 18 year old to chat with the teenage girls in online chat rooms. 
in these online chats, Bradshaw, under the name of Simon, encouraged one of the girls to carry out various sexual acts at the age of 13. Ellen Owen told the judge how he would also have the girl watch as he carried out a sex act. The court heard the pair did try to meet in London when she was just 14 years old, but this was stopped when the girl's father learned of the trip while she was on the train to the capital and threatened to call the police if she did not return home. When the girl turned 15, she pressed Bradshaw for the truth about his age. When he lied further and admitted that he was 21, despite being much older, she pressed him further after seeing a different name on his driver's license, when he confessed to being in his late 20s at the time. They did meet physically at a bus stop near a police station in Essex when the girl was 16, but Bradshaw was said to have left after just 20 minutes. When arrested in June 2018 for these offences, Bradshaw gave no comment answers in interviews by police. They said nothing of evidential value was recovered when he was arrested on these counts. The court heard, however, when he was previously arrested on counts of harassment of an ex-partner, his phone and mobile phone had been seized and was reviewed in light of the new case where he was found to be in possession of the girl's phone number and email address. A further investigation was able to link Bradshaw to the online alias he used to abuse the girls, including his shift patterns when he was a serving police constable in the North Wales region of four, for four years. Bank accounts re revealed he also paid for a trip to London which matched with the victim's trip to meet him. Judge Nicholas Parry gave his sentence and said that Bradshaw's behaviour was completely depraved and went against his duty as a trusted police constable to protect when, in the privacy of his own home, he took advantage of two young girls. As well as the jail sentence, Bradshaw was handed an indefinite sexual harm prevention order and must sign the sex offenders register. A charity in Leeds, the Feed the Homeless project, which helps homeless people by giving them food in the city centre for more than seven years, has been ordered to stop by police and council officials. The order to stop came after apparently numerous complaints were made about the unofficial feed where social distancing was said to be being ignored. The volunteers from Feed the Homeless Project also had also hand out clean socks, underwear, coffee and hot soups every Friday and although the councils have moved many of the rough sleepers into, ho into hostels, they say that they're still feeding about 20 people a week. One of the volunteers, Magda, said our service is important to the people who are still living on the streets. They're hungry. A police officer came to our house and told me that we have to stop feeding the homeless people on the street because they're all in accommodation and they're being fed in hostels. But I asked them, what about the people who are still living on the street? At the beginning of the lockdown, there was about 30 people, but it's now 20. We are helping, she said. Chief Inspector Richard Padwell from Leeds District Police said, Leeds Police are key members of the street support team. As such, we received various complaints about this particular group carrying out unofficial feeds, which was happening without social distancing guidelines always being followed. So why not just offer advice about the social distancing then, instead of taking away some people's only chance to have a decent feed? He said this approach of engaging with people has meant that no enforcement activity has, has to be carried out and no fines issued as a result. Well, bully for you, aren't you just so impressively considerate? We would never stop rough sleepers having the opportunity to receive food and accommodation, he said, especially during what is particularly difficult time. He says, while denying some people who still have no accommodation the right to receive food. What kind of cretin calls the police and complains about people being fed? I mean, this whole lockdown has really shown people's true colours. I think that many people at the end of this are going to find themselves more lonely than they do now. Because nobody likes the grass. And trying to take away people's chance to have a feed is disgusting. And I hope, if you're one of those people, and any of those rough sleepers die as a result, you can see their face in your dreams for the rest of your pathetic and lonely lives. Yesterday I mentioned the Trace and Track app being rolled out. In that report, I did say that as I'm no, as I'm no expert, I didn't quite know how it was going to work to be effective as having it installed on just some people's devices. After a couple of weeks, those people will likely not come into contact with many new people due to behavioral patterns. Thankfully, I had an email from Liam which has given some explanation as to how it would work. Unfortunately, I run this channel alone. I don't have the time to spend researching individual topics more than I currently do, as it takes 
between eight and ten hours a day to make a daily report and so as you are such an awesome community I do get lots of information from you guys who may be well more educated in certain areas than me which allows me to pass that info on to the rest of the community anyway I wanted to share this info with you in case it helps you to understand a little better and in case there's anyone else out there who can help to elaborate any more Liam said hi Dan and all here first off I agree with Dan don't install the app if you like your privacy but it's your choice now for the technical bit there is no way to install a shadow app on mobile operating systems not without having a rooted phone or Google or do Apple doing an operating system update Google and Apple actually created a track and trace app together for the US market but very, that's very secure but NHS said oh we can do it better the way the app works is using Bluetooth which is constantly pumping out a unique code although these shifts over time for security the NHS app stores those codes and it knows which ones you've been near and what codes you've had allowing them to alert you of close contact as Bluetooth only works of a small distance there is some GPS stuff going on also but that's not good enough for this as you might not have gone near enough to the people in that range and it can be off by miles the best thing people can do is turn off Bluetooth when not using it and not connect to open Wi-Fi access points as this might also be used to track people over time using their mobile Mac address. This is done in the US by shopping giants Target to see who and what customers go into what store and buy what. Hope that gives you a bit more info on the track and trace. Now again, I'm no techie when it comes to mobile phones. I'm certainly not a technophobe, but I just don't have the time to learn all of this kind of stuff anymore. So I wanna thank Liam for his email. And as I said, I wanted to share it with you guys in case it gives you a bit more of an insight into the app. But whatever else, I still suggest getting yourself an old Nokia or something for when you go out, something without Bluetooth, GPS, etc., and just use your normal phone when you're at home. Talking of the trace and tracker, it's got to be a warning sign when MPs start to make suggestions that they disagree with it too. In fact, Ian Paisley supposedly sent an email response to a member of the public who contacted a number of MPs about the app and said, mate, I wouldn't let any government, least of all the Northern Ireland executive, track and trace my movements. Although later retracted his statement in normal political style by saying he supported measures to protect the health of the nation no doubt after a telling off. It's a shame these MPs think more about their yearly wage than their morals. Rather than being a man of honour and sticking to his opinion in his retraction, he stated, Oops, was replying in a jocular manner to a friend and obviously sent you all an email by mistake. Of course I support measures to protect the health of our nation and our government and Northern Ireland executive. Hope you saw the funny side of that, Ian. The original email from a member of the public said the government should be focused on contact tracing and called for responsibility to be devolved to local health centres who can be trusted. Mr Paisley, who represents North Antrim in the Commons, said he did not know the person who sent the original email and was trying to respond to another MP but accidentally replied to everyone in the chain. Which begs the question again, where do the MP's morals lay? If he is willing to tell another MP he wouldn't let any government, least of all the NIA executive, track and trace his movements, but then telling the public he supports it, it just goes to show that incredible double standard and how they simply don't give a shit about the public they're supposed to be representing. The Department of Health has said that all information shared with the NHS test and trace service is confidential and will not be passed on to the police or other bodies. They've said that in order to contain the virus, it's important that people share accurate information on who they've been in contact with. People who have confirmed COVID-19 will be contacted and asked about their interactions, including people who have been within two metres for more than 15 minutes. Which does seem a little weird to me, as why would it be more likely to have been contracted from someone after 15 minutes more than after five minutes? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Anyone identified will be told to self-isolate for 14 days, even if they do not have symptoms and seek a test if they develop COVID-19. Isolation instructions are currently voluntary, but the Department of Health said that tougher measures would be introduced if people do not comply, such as home visits and fines. The service, seen as key to easing lockdown restrictions, has been rolled out across England with the help of 25,000 contact tracers, while a separate app has been delayed note to self unknown numbers private numbers or numbers not in my phone book blocked 
Matt Hancock said, I think the vast majority of people will understand that it is in everybody's interest that those who are in higher risk follow the request from the NHS, these instructions, and it is very important that they do. This is about how we as a country, we get out of this lockdown in the safest possible way, short of having a vaccine or an effective treatment, which obviously we're working on, but we don't have yet, and which obviously there is no guarantee you will ever have. Let's be honest. The health protection regulations, which allow people to find and arrest people, which allow the health protection regulations, which allows for people to be fined and arrested for breaking some of the lockdown regulations. The health protection regulations, which currently allow people to be fined and arrested for breaking certain areas of that legislation, currently make it a problem to leave home without reasonable excuse, but don't actually contain powers on isolation requirements. The Coronavirus Act empowers public health officials and police to order potentially infectious people to a place suitable for screening and assessment, but not actually in their own homes. And this is something I'm gonna to have to keep checking the legislation for as they seem to forget telling the public until way after it's already in place. The national launch of an NHS contract uh, contact tracing app has been delayed but Hancock played down its importance on Thursday. He said the pilot on the Isle of Wight showed that the best thing to do was to introduce the human contact tracing and then build on that once people have got used to the idea. Nobody wants to get used to the idea. I'm going to wonder how many buddies of, of his are going to be doing exactly what we're being asked to do. I don't think the government realised just how big this thing is that they're asking us to do. I mean, people with mental health issues who have just started getting out and finding a little normality in their lives could have that whipped out from under them in an instant, causing some severe psychological issues. This whole thing really, really has not been thought out very well. Staying on the subject of the Test and Trace app, it's been said that Public Health England will be keeping your personal details and those of people you come into contact with for 20 years. 20 years! The majority of people who are most susceptible to coronavirus are over 70 with already underlying health conditions. No offence, but they'll probably be dead well within 20 years anyway, be it from coronavirus or their pre-existing health problems, so 20 years seems incredibly excessive. Information to be retained will include your full name, date of birth, as well as phone numbers and home and email addresses. Those who have been identified as contacts of people with coronavirus will have all but their date of birth collected and stored for five years. Public Health England said COVID-19 is a new disease. It is not yet clear of the long-term impacts on public health will be either on people who have been diagnosed with the disease or their close contacts. So if you don't know the long-term impacts, why not make short-term plans and review them? Businesses only have to keep records for about six years, so why not do similar and then review the need to retain the data after that? They continued, it is important that Public Health England is able to retain information about these cases and their contacts to help control any future outbreaks or to provide any new treatments. This information will be held securely by Public Health England and only used for purposes that help protect the public's health from COVID-19. Okay. It is held on Public Health England's secure cloud environment, which is kept up to date to protect it from viruses and hacking. It can only be seen by those who have a specific and legitimate role in the response and who are working on the NHS test and trace. All these staff have been trained to protect people's confidentiality. Now, I'm not going to waste anyone's time listing all of the secure websites that have been hacked, the countless data breaches from government, police or other organisations that are also supposed to be protected from viruses or hacking, or from the people who have also been trained to protect people's confidentiality. Because we'll be here all fucking day. David Grout of the information security company FireEye said, the length of time the data is being stored for and the lack of personal control on how the data is being used and kept are bound to cause privacy concerns. This might not be too much of a headache for the government while manual tracking is the norm, but it will become more of an issue when NHSX's contract contact tracing app is launched as this will rely on the public opting in for the project to work. Concerns surrounding the usage of the data in the app and how long the data is stored could well affect the number of downloads of a full national rollout. No shit, Sherlock. Big thank you to the channel Patreon supporters. Your support is, of course, always truly appreciated. 
And that's all I have for you today. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police, film other officials, and have a fantastic weekend. Good night, all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.